Hello everyone, it is 2 p.m. It is Friday, so it is time for Friday Forecasting Talks. My name is Ivan Svetunkov. I'm a lecturer of Marketing Analytics and a member of Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting, acting as a Marketing Director. And today we will have presentation by Anna Lina Sachs. Uh, she's a CIMAF member, so she's one of us, and she will be telling us about uh, news vendor biases, empirical news vendor biases. But before she does that, I wanted to say a couple of words about the center. So I typically start with this slide showing who we are, how many members we have, uh, and saying that we provide different services and different expertise. Uh, but I typically don't go into many details. And this time I decided that I will probably say a bit more about one specific thing, Master Summer Projects. So it won't be too long, but uh, hopefully it will give you an idea about this activity. So this might be useful for you if uh, you have a specific problem in, pra in practice that you want to solve. Uh, you need some sort of expertise and preferably from people who know something about the area. So academic expertise but you do not have resources to do that in-house. Obviously, we have limited time and it's not always possible to invest in uh, smaller things that uh, you think are not pressing at this moment. So examples of this master project would be in which, uh, you, could have, uh, you could have a need to do benchmarking to see if process can be improved somehow or develop a proce procedure for something or develop an R or Python code for practical application. Uh, this is typically done over the summer, starting from end of May, finishing end of August. This is done by a student of uh, management science. So this is a student from business analytics program who is uh, very good at forecasting, statistics, uh, operations research and other things. So they know what they are doing. They're typically very good students and they are supervised by us by the members of the center. Uh, and this is totally free for you. So master projects are free for practitioners. You don't need to pay anything. In a way, we want uh, to have these projects to uh, for the students to have some sort of practice and for us to get in touch with you, you know, and to learn more about reality. And what you will get typically is a report explaining what was done, why it was done, what can be done to improve your uh, situation, your process. You might get a code, uh, for example, R code, or Python, and so on. And in fact, whatever else you want uh, within the reasonable <laughs> limits. So if you want uh, a student to um, deliver some presentation, they will deliver a presentation, for example. Uh, last but not least, uh, examples of topics. So this could be something on forecasting. As you know, we have uh, large expertise in this area. On inventory management, we also have expertise and uh, Anna Lino is one of our leading experts, so she will be presenting today. Uh, a bit on marketing research or marketing analytics. Uh, it's me and a couple of other members of the center who could uh, supervise this. Uh, pricing, optimization. Well, actually, many other topics, and even even if you have an area, the topic that we cannot do, we will have uh, our colleagues from management science department who would be able to handle it. Anyway, enough of the advertising. Uh, if you want to get which, uh, in touch with us, or you, for example, want to learn more about this master project or any other project, you have uh, these means to do that on Twitter, LinkedIn, you can send us email directly. Uh, you can find information about us on our website. We have YouTube where we publish videos from uh, different events and we have a landing page about the Friday forecasting talks. Okay, I think I've talked enough. So let's now move uh, to our presentation. Uh, so Anlina, you can start sharing your screen. Good. So can you see my presentation now? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Annalina Sachs and I'm a lecturer in predictive analytics at Lancaster University. 
And um, I'm going to pre uh, present a joint work with um, several colleagues today. So this is joint work with uh, Michael Becker-Pitt, who is at Rotterdam School of Management, Stefan Minner, who is at Technical University of Munich, and Ulrich Thonemann, who is at University of Cologne. And um, the topic of my talk is empirical news vendor decision biases. And I'm going to look at um, a practical example to see whether target service levels are achieved effectively and efficiently. And this research is motivated by a practical example. So we looked at data from a large European retail chain and um, we analyzed what kind of decision biases we could find in their setting. And also um, we developed an analytical approach to how the problem could actually be solved optimally. So why is this even important? Um, so we were looking at um, data from a large retail chain and um, this retail chain sells a lot of perishable products. And the difficulty with perishable products is that if you don't sell them within the shelf life that they have, then they go to waste. And um, this is something that's happening a lot. So we see um, many newspaper articles about food waste, and this is also accepted more and more as a big global challenge that needs to be resolved somehow, because this is a large waste of resources. So if you think about all these fruits and vegetables um, that they need to be grown, there is a lot of there are a lot of natural resources that go into the production processes of these um, products. And uh, if they are wasted, then actually you're throwing all these resources away. And um, yeah, this is a big issue in the UK, but um, also everywhere in the world. Um, there are articles about Japan, the US, and um, yeah, you find these articles in almost um, every country, I would say. And yeah, this, this is an important challenge that we are all struggling with. And um, yeah, I guess, you know, you, you know this feeling yourself if you bought too much food and then it goes bad and you have to throw it away um, and your fridge is full, but yeah, you, you have to make space somehow. Um, and, and this usually hurts if you have to throw food away. So we're trying to avoid that in our daily lives, but this is also a problem at a bigger scale when you look at um, the retail stores. So there, there is an interesting study um, that was conducted about where food is wasted. And in this study, they looked at the food supply chain. So they started from harvesting to the end consumer, and then they looked at each stage of the supply chain. So if you look at the amount of food wasted at each stage, you see that already at harvesting stage, 5% of the food is wasted. Um, this is usually due to being mechanically destroyed during harvesting. Post harvesting, there are also many processes like cleaning, transportation, storage. There could be some temperature problems, some mold, some diseases, and this all goes into the losses that occur here. That's about 9%. Then processing, another 14%. And then distribution. So this is where um, the consumer or the customer meets um, the supply. So for example, a retail store. So here we have 14%, so that's already quite a lot. And then also at the end consumer. So the amount of food that we throw away at home is about 39%, so that's quite a lot. Now, what was also investigated in this study was where is the biggest potential to avoid food being wasted? And um, it seems that there is not that much that can be done at the harvesting and post-harvesting stage and also not so much at processing. 
But at the distribution stage, there is actually a 90% probability of avoiding losses. So this is huge. And this just shows how much potential there is to intervene by, for example, having um, new algorithms, new approaches to improve the um, matching of supply and demand. So there are several solutions to these problems and um, France, for example, introduced a law to forbid food waste. So they introduced a law that supermarkets had to do something with food before it goes to waste. That could also mean going to charities, for example. Um, Morrison's um, has um, yeah, offers food through an app. Um, I actually have this, this app on my mobile. Um, it's too good to go. And they sent you a message before food goes bad and then you can pick it up. Um, they tell you where they have food left over and then you can go and pick it up. Then we have other companies who pledged that they're going to have food waste. So many companies are involved in this and there has also been some an interesting article in Harvard Business Review where they discuss different ideas how to avoid food waste and the number one point is to upgrade inventory systems with the latest technology so to use advancements in software and technology to make um, better inventory decisions and this is exactly what I want to talk about today. Yeah, if you um, consider the two extreme cases um, that and, and the challenge that a retailer faces, so the retailer usually has to decide um, how many items they want to order and how many items they want to put on the shelf. And obviously they want to do that in a way that makes the customer happy. So they want to avoid stockouts. If there is a stockout and the customer comes to the store, the customer then doesn't get the product that they wanted to buy. And then with almost 50% probability, they choose another product instead. So substitution occurs and the other half is actually a lost sale. So they just don't buy the product at all. And if this happens once, then probably the customer doesn't care that much about it. They will just buy the product the next time they come or buy it somewhere else. But if this happens frequently, then there is a big impact on customer goodwill. And if the customer is not happy, then probably the customer won't come again. And the customer might choose to go to a different store in the future. And this is something that the retailers want to avoid. But then on the other hand, if they keep every product in stock all the time, even if it's just before closing the store and they know they can't sell that product again on the next day, then they would incur large amounts of leftover inventory. And um, this amounts to 10% of fresh products, according to some studies. And um, I put the number here for Germany because um, I'm going to look at a data set from Germany in, in the next steps. Um, and this is 11 million tons of um, food that are um, wasted um, annually. So the interesting question is, how can they actually avoid that? And some of you have probably come across the news vendor model before. The news vendor model is supposed to balance product availability and product waste. So we're doing exactly this, or, um, the, the problem that the retailer is facing. So we're trying to solve exactly this kind of problem. And um, there are several assumptions that are made in um, this model. And um, usually, yeah, in, in a retail setting, you, you have some products that fit to these assumptions. So first of all, the products are perishable. So they have a limited lifetime. And this is what we have in the example that I'm going to show you. We're going to look at some bakery products in the next step. And these bakery products have a shelf life of exactly one period only. Um, they all also need to choose orders 
before observe demand. So the store manager has to make an order decision today for, for example, tomorrow or the day after, and they don't know yet what the demand is going to be in the next couple of days. Also, um, the order should arrive before the store opens. So the order arrives once per day. So usually in the morning before the store opens, the baker or manufacturer brings the different items to the store. So we have a delivery in the morning and there is there are no additional deliveries later during that day. Um, if there is any leftover inventory at the end of the day, then this has to be discarded or um, it can be sold at a salvage value. So for example, if you see in a store that you can get products for half the price, um, then they sell the items at a salvage value. In the setting that we are considering, there is no salvage value. So um, the everything that's left over um, goes to waste. So what does this mean from the customer's point of view? So the customer just goes to the store and wishes to find all the products that they have on their shopping list. So they are just trying to get as, as many of these products that they wanted to buy. And if a product is not available, then usually they are unhappy and potentially they might look for another product or they just decide not to buy the product instead. And um, in this picture, you can see what typical bakery um, in Germany looks like. So you see many different types of bread. You see different types of roll. And um, in this example, you don't see them, but usually they also sell a lot of sweet pastries and cake and so on. So if we consider the setting from the manufacturer's point of view, so the manufacturer is the company that produces these bakery products. So they deliver the products to the store and they usually bake them overnight. So early in the morning at around seven o'clock, the manufacturer delivers these products to the stores and then collects any leftover inventory from the previous day. And then at eight o'clock, the store opens and um, yeah, demand occurs during the day. And towards the end of the day, um, the manufacturer already has to start planning for the next day again. So the manufacturer starts to produce the next order and then the next morning the manufacturer comes to the store and delivers the products and collects any leftover inventory from the previous day. And um, yeah, the stores are open from eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the evening. Um, yeah, so in this supply chain, we have the manufacturer who bakes the products, then delivers them to the retailer, and then any leftover inventory is returned to the manufacturer. And that's actually quite important because by collecting the leftover inventory, the manufacturer sees what the demand was because the manufacturer knows how much they delivered on the previous day and then what they are collecting at the end, uh, at the start of the next day. So they can see then what was, how much was sold in between. And all the bakery products have a lifetime of exactly one day. Um, that's also quite important here. Now, what makes this um, setting interesting is in the standard news vendor problem, we would look at each item separately. So we would look at one type of bread, then look at the different parameters that we have for that product. So for example, we could look at the selling price and the manufacturing cost to see what kind of margin we have on that product, or we could have um, a target service level. And this is actually what the company does. So the retailer wants to have a target service level of 70%. And this is defined as a minimum in-stock probability. So if you consider 100 days, then on at least 70 days, the product has to be in stock by the time that the shop um, closes. Um, now, what is special about this setting is that the retailer requires an aggregate service level. So instead of looking at each product individually, they look at all the products together and they want to achieve a minimum in stock probability across all the products. 
Now, if you think about this uh, for a second, then you are like, oh, OK, actually, that's quite useful, right? Because if there is one product where you have a higher margin than for another product, then you might choose to have a bit more of the product with the higher margin than for the product with the lower margin, everything else being equal. And you know you can you can use these kind of trade offs to de to decide if you want to have a bit more of one product than of another. And in the end, you would still achieve this average service level of 70%. And this could be, for example, driven by your costs. So if costs for one product are higher than for another product, then you would probably want to have more of the product with the lower cost everything else being equal. Another aspect that then comes into play is the demand variability. So some products might be easier to forecast than others. So you would probably go for a, a higher service level for a product that's easier to forecast because then you know that you're going to sell this for sure, even if you're ordering a bit more or not for sure, but with a higher um, you can have um, a lot of trust in these numbers and you can um, plan that you would um, sell as much as you're planning to. Whereas with a product where you have a lot of variability, you would be a bit more cautious because you know that it could, demand could be very different to what you expected. And in that case, you would probably order a bit less of that kind of product. And this is exactly what we, um, we did then with our algorithm. So we took these effects into account and then we can calculate um, the optimal solution given the characteristics of the different items. So the data set that we um, collected was daily data. So we looked at daily order quantities and we also looked at hourly sales data. So for two years of data, we collected um, this information hourly and we looked at 64 retail stores that are open Monday to Saturday. So stores are usually closed on a Sunday in Germany. Um, so Monday to Saturday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we looked at 23 bakery products uh, that consisted of 11 different types of breads four different types of rolls, eight different types of pastries. And there is one more distinction that I haven't mentioned yet. So we also distinguish the items into make or buy products. So the make products are those that the manufacturer um, produces themselves and the buy products are bought by the manufacturer from another external supplier. Um, and the, the manufacturer has an aggregate service level target of 70%. Now, what is interesting here, if you look at the, this graph, you can see the different stores on the X axis and the actual service level on the Y axis. And there is some fluctuation between the different stores, but overall the service level is very close to the target service level. So it's 69.3%, which is um, really close for an empirical setting. Now, when we look at these, uh, the data itself and the different products that they sold, um, no worries, I'm not going to read this whole table. Um, I know it's a lot of numbers. Um, what I want to show here is that there are different ways how you can categorize the data and that will be quite important for the algorithm. So you could, for example, split the data into the different types of bakery products. So by bread, rolls and pastry. And then you would have a certain number of products for each one of these um, categories. So you could split them by the product type. You could also split them by the category. So whether these are make or buy products. So whether the manufacturer bakes these products um, themselves or whether these are bought from an external supplier. And another split um, could be on an ABC classification. 
So an ABC classification is quite common in inventory management and products are usually clustered into three categories uh, based on their contribution to the total cost. So usually the top 20% of the products, um, so these are the products with the highest total cost, are classified as A products, the next 30% as B products, and the last 50% as C products. And this is what we did here. And um, yeah, you can see that there is no clear distinction. So it's not like all breads would be of a certain type or all pastry, all rolls. So that you can see that this is quite mixed here. So um, yeah, what something else that we needed to do was to estimate demand, because if you think about a retail setting, then you would probably realize that the retailer only observes sales, but not demand. So if there is a stock out, then the retailer needs to estimate what the demand probably was. And there is um, a, an a approach that works quite well um, by Lau and Lau um, to estimate the lost sales. So according to this approach, we derived daily sales patterns. So we looked at how the demand usually occurs. So you can see that there is some peak in demand um, around probably that's around lunchtime and then demand goes down um, in the afternoon. And if we now have a day where a stock out occurs, so here on the left hand side, you can see that the stock out occurs around 4 p.m. And now we can use this information by estimating the remaining um, the demand that probably would have occurred during the rest of the day. We can also estimate substitution rates in a similar way. Um, there is an approach by Karabati et al. and they categorize the data into um, the different combinations of whether a stock out occurred or not. Now, one important point is that the supplier does not have access to hourly sales data. So we used this approach um, by Lau and Lau as a benchmark. So we wanted to see what the demand um, was, but only for evaluating the different approaches. To estimate the parameters, we took a different approach. So we took an approach based on the daily sales data by Bell and um, Wecker. And this is the first step that somebody who had to, um, like the manufacturer, who wanted to solve this problem optimally should conduct. So the first step would be to estimate the demand based on the sales data. Then the next step would be to forecast future demand. So we looked at um, seasonality within the week and also the autocorrelation across weeks. And we could find, we found that for example, a Monday is highly correlated with a Monday of the previous week. Um, and there is also some seasonality within the week, which has also been shown um, in other work. And then once we have a forecast, we can then move on to optimize the order quantity using the aggregate service level model. And um, yeah, I've, I've tried to explain the intuition a bit um, of this model. I don't want to go um, into the formulas, um, but essentially you're reducing uh, the service level of one product um, if the underage, uh, the overage costs are high, um, uh, if, the, if the service level of a product increases in its underage costs, and you would decrease the service level of a product if the demand variability is high. So um, this is yeah, the, the example that I showed before, um, just a bit um, more formally. And um, if you're interested in the formulas, then I'm happy to send uh, you our paper. So based on um, this analytical model, we um, then applied the model to the data, and then we wanted to estimate, to, to compare it to what the manufacturer actually did. So some of these results, so first of all, um, we looked at the forecasting, and uh, we applied single exponential smoothing to the data based on um, the high correlation 
from one week to the previous week um, weeks demand and um, yeah there is um, yeah we then estimated the smoothing parameter based on the data and we found that the optimal smoothing parameter so in this uh, formula here this is eta is actually small so that's 0 0.25 but if we look at the empirical smoothing factor, so what the manufacturer actually used, we can see that this is higher. So this is 0 0.44. And um, this is actually in line with other literature where um, Grema et al. showed that if ETA should be small, people tend to overreact to recent demand. And this is exactly what we see in the setting. And you can also see this nicely in this graph here on the left hand side. So the red bar is the autocorrelation of demand and the black bar is the correlation between the order quantity of the manufacturer and the lag demand. And you can see that the black bar is higher than the um, red bar because the manufacturer overreacts to um, the recent demand. We also looked at biases in inventory management and um, we found that first of all there is um, an inventory error minimization bias so this is in line with the literature so the psychological cost of leftovers are greater than the psychological cost of stockouts which kind of makes sense because it hurts if you have to throw leftovers away um, and the stockouts you don't observe them immediately. So the um, psychological cost of left hours in our setting were higher than the psychological cost of stockouts. <clears throat> we also find a new bias um, and this is um, what we call the group aggregation bias. So by making use of this setting with um, a system wide service level, the manufacturer could choose to have a higher service level for some group of products and for another group of products. And um, since we found that the correlation between the average actual and the optimal service levels is um, rather low. Um, so this is what you can see here on the left hand side. If you compare the actual service level with the optimal service level, so there is a low correlation here. It's only 0 0.28, um, but if we split the data into make products and buy products, we can see that the service levels are much closer together for the make products and for the buy products if we split them into these groups. Now this leads then to another interesting question, which is should we look at other groupings as well? And um, we have here on the left hand side a grouping with all 23 products as individual clusters. So this is what we call here the optimal and we have um, normalized this to 100%. Then the other extreme would be to have just one cluster. So all products <coughs> um, together. So we have just one cluster and in that case um, we can see that the efficiency is 10% lower than optimally. Now we can also now we have to make by grouping. So this is what I just um, presented. And here we can see that the manufacturer can actually capture a lot of that efficiency by having two clusters instead of just one. And we then compared it to other clusters, for example, the ABC analysis and the product type. And you can see here that the efficiency is even a bit higher than with just two clusters. But if we compare it to the actual decisions of the manufacturer and the fit to the actual decisions, we find that the fit of the make or buy clustering is actually the closest. So we think that this describes the manufacturer's actions best. And what is quite interesting here is that the manufacturer can capture a lot of this efficiency by having just two clusters instead of one. Um, but avoids having to um, have all this computational effort of having 23 individual clusters. So to summarize, if we look at the effect of um, these different biases on the total profit, 
then we can find that behavioral forecasting, so the biases through behavioral forecasting reduces our profit by about 2.5%. Group aggregation has the biggest effect with more than 5% and the inventory error has an effect of 0.1%. And overall, the manufacturer is almost 8% below the optimal profit. So yeah, what, what we did here was, um, first of all, we wanted to have some new analytical insights for this aggregate service level contract. And um, yeah, I avoided using the formulas, at least most of them here. Um, but if you're interested, I'm really happy to send you the paper. We um, could observe several behavioral biases in the real world that were previously observed in the lab. So we had this nice practical setting where we could actually analyze um, different biases and um, some managerial insights. So we think that it helps to reduce decision biases by educating managers and making them uh, aware of the different biases that could potentially happen. And by having individual service level targets, the profits could be increased. Of course, there's some limitations, so we needed to make um, different assumptions in order to be able to apply these models and to have a tractable solution. And um, for future research, it would be nice to see such model applied um, in decision support tools to actually help the managers and see how they deal with this information. OK, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Annalena. That was uh, an interesting presentation. Now we have a comment from Stefan. So Stefan, over, over to you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Annalena. That was an enormously interesting talk. So I enjoyed it very much, very much. Uh, was very, very much of that sounded very familiar to me because we um, we have been doing forecasting and inventory control for Parish Bolts 2 for a while and just recently launched a product for cost optimal ordering, which aims at exactly this kind of, of problem here. And so many of the things that you uh, talked about sounded extremely familiar and just a little anecdote that I have here. And since you said that this, uh, this retailer doesn't have salvaging, uh, so they don't sell leftovers at the end of the day for lower prices. And of course, people might, might wonder why don't they do that? It would be better to at least get some money out of the stuff before they throw it away. Uh, one of our customers did that and moved away from that because they said what they, they used to do that with sandwiches, prepared sandwiches and convenience. Uh, what they observed was that their store employees would hide the sandwiches and uh, in the back room and then buy them themselves at the end of the day for their dinner at lower prices at the salvage price and they didn't really like that. So they stopped that practice and that kind of uh, is uh, saves me into into a kind of a I, I'm slightly um, skeptical about that one study that you presented about from the WWF about 90% possibility of avoiding the wa waste in in uh, in distribution. I, I don't believe that. And fortunately, I speak German, so I'm going to look at that present at that uh, papers and uh, try to tear it apart because. Uh, there is so much stuff happening in here that is uh, simply unavoidable and it's just yeah things like this here in theory salvaging would make sense and would make people buy stuff that's almost expired but in practice yeah the store employees start abusing the system and it's stuff like that that means that simple theoretical solutions often simply don't work. But yeah, as I said, very, very enjoyable. I also enjoyed the, the discussion about demand chasing, which many of our customers happen to engage into, very much like to engage into. They always want the forecasts to be adaptive, highly adaptive forecasts, and it's uh, they just want to chase, chase the latest noise, and it's very hard to, to disabuse them of that notion. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and since Ivan said that uh, we'll take the tricky questions from the audience, I'm just going to ask the simple questions here and the easy questions. Uh, you're already laughing, you know what's going to come now. Uh, specifically, one question that I have is, uh, you talked about the inventory of minimization as a bias, uh, as a, um, a, a cognitive bias where leftovers uh, incurred a higher cost than uh, stockouts, uh, slide 20, something like that. 
Um, I'm, I'm not really happy about that because uh, saying that this is a bias means uh, would mean to me that uh, the cost that people uh, are, are minimizing is not the true costs because otherwise if they're minimizing the true costs and it's not a bias anymore. So and for that you would need a notion of the true costs of overage and underage. And that's something that I find extremely hard to elicit because it's not only the costs of lost sales, it's also the cost of lost goodwill. If I walk into the bakery and uh, every day I don't find the product that I want to buy there, then at some point in time, I'm not even going to come in anymore. And that is something that is extremely hard to estimate. And conversely, uh, if I don't see what I want to buy, then I buy something else. I have the substitution effect about 55%. So there's, so the baker captures at least some of the of the lost sales from sales on a different product. And yes, we can estimate the substitution effects, but it's still only an estimate, and there's variable variability in here. And so I would be very cautious and careful about saying we know the true costs of overage and underage, and so anything that deviates from that, we can label a bias. So any thoughts from you? Yeah, I, I know I know what you are heading at. There is this general discussion of, OK, how do you actually estimate underage and overage costs in retailing? And I think that's still an unresolved issue. So we only looked at monetary costs here. Um, so we looked at um, the data that we had from the company and there was actually a challenge challenge to estimate some of the production costs because yeah. Um, so we talked um, to the German Bakery Association and they helped us to estimate these costs. So based on the typical usage and so on. But still, yeah, we could not estimate loss of customer goodwill costs. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you that this is extremely difficult um, to estimate. In um, we, we use this um, model um, by Ho et al, where you calculate some psychological costs of um, leftovers and stock outs. Um, but yes, given that everything else is monetary. And yeah, if, if, if you ever come across a paper that actually is able to have some valid suggestions on true overage or underage cost, I would be really interested because this is the discussion that always comes up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and actually it's not only a theoretical question for papers, it's a question that we struggle with in implementing our solution at the customer because yeah, we want to provide cost optimal orders, but for that you need the costs and always have to kind of make some kinds of assumptions. Uh, what I personally have usually found is that uh, it makes sense to at least put the, the costs on a whiteboard and have people estimating them and then run your model and see where you, where you end up with and then get some kind of sensitivity analysis and kind of use it as a conversation starter just so people start talking about it. And are our assumptions correct here? Do we actually have assumptions? Do we have assumptions that we don't talk about? Stuff like that. So it gets uh, very psychotherapeutic at some point in time, which is funny. Yeah. Um, uh, Ivan, do, do you want to go all over to the tricky questions or do you want me to continue with the easy ones? Um, whatever you prefer, whatever is more exciting. Oh, exciting. I, I have an exciting question. I have a question about exponential smoothing and that's exciting. Everybody likes exponential smoothing. Uh, you mentioned you said you used single exponential smoothing. That surprised me because uh, of course there's seasonality. So why wouldn't you use double exponential smoothing? So we used it on the weekday. So we only used a Monday to estimate a Monday for exactly that same reason. And we wanted to keep the solution tractable so that we can could do all these other nice analysis afterwards. So yeah. Yeah, because otherwise you have two smoothing yeah. parameters and it's hard to mm -hmm. say that people do demand chasing and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And especially this um, behavioral forecasting parameter, because you have to run all different possibilities to see which one provides the best fit. So yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, that was a simple question, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll ask a more complicated question now. Um, or first a comment, first a comment. I, I, I liked it very much that you started out uh, with the, the motivation of the entire topic was to reduce waste, which is an important topic, yes. 
And then a couple of slides later, you talked about the 70% service level, which is just a 70% in stock um, uh, probability at the end of the day. And I mentally translated that into a 70% probability of waste at the end of the day. Because if you have a 70% probability of having stock at the end of the day, that's exactly what you're going to throw away. So it's kind of it, it kind of clashed with the entire thought of reducing waste. And yeah, and that's exactly uh, the thing that I talked about at the very beginning of my comments about how hard it is really to reduce the waste in retail and distribution, because if the customer comes in and doesn't see their product, if they don't get what they want, then they're not going to return. And that's very hard. But that was just a comment. Um, can I just, just can I come in that comment? You can, you can. Uh, because that's, that's a really interesting point. Um, so, so the idea essentially is that we could achieve the same service level, but by better matching demand and supply. But yes, you're right. Obviously, this is the whole thing about how can you, you know, I, I've read that study, the WWF study, and um, yeah, that is, it assumes a very idealistic setting how you can avoid um, food waste and the kind of actions you can take and obviously demand variability, demand uncertainty, all of that comes into play when you try to actually avoid um, food waste and also managing customer expectations. So, well, if every customer was fine with just finding very few products, if they go shopping in the evening, then we wouldn't have any food waste, but that's not how we all work and uh, what we want to find when we go shopping. So that that's definitely a problem. Um, and I'm actually doing some work in that field right now. So if anybody of the audience here is interested in looking at this into more detail, how to actually avoid then food waste in a practical setting, then I'm very happy to, to receive emails or contact requests via LinkedIn and um, to discuss this with you in more detail because We've, we've recently ran some exper some experiments on that and um, we found some some interesting results, but it's a totally different research topic. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I may actually write you an email on that later on. Good. So, <laughs> if nobody else does. Eva, do we already have some questions from the from the audience? Well, we have a couple of questions and plus uh, my, my question, but uh, and maybe I if you still have something. I have like a full page with comments, <laughs> so we can <laughs> tack on another hour after this year. So perhaps you want to talk to the okay. to the to the audience first. OK, let's uh, see what the audience says and uh, we can switch to Stefan at any moment, I guess. Mm. Well, one of the questions that I see is that uh, being a retail operation, uh, how did you determine lost sales and st substitution statistics? I think it relates to what Stefan was saying, right? Um, yeah, so for the lost sales, uh, I guess you mean the, the estimation of the lost sales directly. So in that case, um, we use the Bell Becker approach from the manufacturer's perspective because we wanted to use exactly the same amount of information that the manufacturer has available. And um, this approach is based on the normal distribution. So we then estimate the tail of the distribution, given that we observe only truncated demand. But then for the evaluation, we wanted to use an approach that takes more information into account. And we benchmark then both approaches with this additional information. So we use the Lao and Lao approach, um, which is based on establishing daily demand patterns. And then you can estimate how much demand you would probably have seen towards the end of the day. Um, and the other question about the substitution rates, um, that's also based on a paper where we then classified whether there was a stock out and um, you would then look at the effect of that stock out on other products by fitting a model to that using linear programming and minimizing the error between um, these fits. So that was a bit technical. I apologize. Um, Robert already has his video on. I don't know if you. <laughs> yes, Robert, do you want to ask a question? Uh, it's a follow up. It's a non technical follow up. <laughs> Really, and possibly more to Stefan than to you, Anna. But um, how do uh, uh, software packages or um, 
high, highly available software packages like your own, Stefan. Uh, how do they deal with uh, this question? OK, uh, I don't know how much of our of our dirty linen I want to wash in public, but we don't really do. Um, we are not doing any substitution effect modeling and in terms of the um, uh, of inferring lost sales, we essentially uh, do a, sim um, a very simple approach. We uh, remove data where we had lost sales at the end of the day where sales didn't happen. Um, in terms of forecasting, I always I have a personal um, philosophical difference with inferring and in, and and um, you know, with filling in data that I don't know and then using that data in forecasting because I kind of I'm pulling data out of out of a hat and then using that as if it were true. So I'd rather throw data away and uh, live with the uncertainty. That's very puritanical of you. I certainly wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Anna, do you have a comment here? Yeah, yeah, we actually looked at that as well. So what if we just took these data points out? But first of all, we would then lose a lot of data points. And also, um, you know, it can happen that especially the days with high demand um, then incur a stock out. So we would systematically eliminate all days with a higher demand. And then we would also plan too low for the future. So we needed to have this kind of estimate for exactly that reason. Mm -hmm. OK, well, there is a related question in the chat. Um, so what are the different approaches to estimate demand in case of stock out? Can you recommend, uh, well, anything? Oh, yeah. Oh, I've, I've spent a lot of time with, with these different approaches during my PhD. So um, yeah, I looked at um, parametric and non-parametric approaches. So parametric means that um, you assume some kind of demand distribution. And um, I've looked at, for example, the normal distribution, but also negative binomial and other distributions. And then, first of all, I checked whether the distribution would fit to the data. So that's one important um, aspect. And then I compared um, the performance of these approaches by artificially censoring data. So I took data where I had complete demand observations and I cut off part of the um, demand and then I estimated it using these approaches to see how good they would fit then and then I could compare that to the actual demand observation. And um, I found that based on this, um, the Lao Lao approach, which is a non parametric one because it only needs the um, daily demand patterns, um, work best for the data. OK, thanks. Uh, I have a question actually to both of you. Mm, it's a bit philosophical, I think. Uh, so I don't work uh, with news vendor that much, to be honest. But as far as I understand, the main idea is uh, to reduce the costs, so you select uh, some sort of level to reduce uh, the costs. And correct me if I'm wrong here. But uh, this is on one hand for the company, they want to reduce costs, increase profit. And on the other hand, there is an environmental issue uh, where we don't want uh, products to go to waste. So is there a way to reconcile these two things? Because they don't necessarily uh, have the same aim to not necessarily agree. So Anna maybe uh, can comment first. Um, I think there are different aspects. So it's not necessarily only about profit maximizing or cost minimization. It can also be about achieving a target service level. So like, like in this example, um, and then you would want to do this with a minimum of resources. So you obviously it would be really easy to achieve a high service level by just ordering a lot and a lot more than what you need, but this is not what you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of food waste and avoiding food waste, I think there is a lot of potential by, for example, selling leftover inventory on the next day. And this is also something that the retailer tried out later on. So after we conducted the study, and we also conducted a follow-up study where we actually um, made recommendations of order quantities to the um, retail retail stores. And um, after that 
addition, this other field experiment, they actually introduced some um, this, this policy that they would sell leftovers at the next day. But you have some cannibalization effects then, and um, this makes it also more challenging than from a research perspective to analyze. But my, my personal view is that I think that retailers can be can do a lot more to avoid food waste. And um, there are different other aspects, like, for example, the picking behavior um, that is quite important here. So how do you display products? Then when do you decide to um, sell a product at a discounted price? Um, so does it have to be the next day or, you know, if you think of other products like yogurt, for example, where you have many different um, brands and different shell, le leftover shelf lives. I think there is a lot of potential um, to do more and to avoid food waste. And um, given these incentives by governments, like for example, France that introduced such a law, um, I think this is going to provoke more interest also from practice to do something like that. And yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in doing that. So. Please, if, if somebody wants to discuss this with me in more detail, I'm, I'm more than happy to. OK, thanks. Uh, Stefan, do you have anything to add? Um, uh, I'll start with your original question and then comment on, on what Anna just said. Um, uh, I, I personally don't see a problem with uh, using news vendor models and similar to also include the address waste because waste is essen essentially a type of cost. We don't like to waste product and we can assign a cost to it and then it changes the service level. Yeah, the higher our, our discomfort with waste is, the lower our target service level will be. And it's it's simple and people will say I'm economizing or I'm, I'm applying econometric, economic uh, thoughts or thought patterns to something that's more of a political thing. And I, I answer, well, we're trading off different uh, goals, different targets. So one target is having low waste, yes, and the other target is getting people, um, giving people some choice when they go shopping at seven o'clock in the evening. And uh, I think we can all agree that there is some social benefit to having more than one type of bread left over when we go shopping at seven in the evening. So, and there is a trade-off here and economics is all about this here. And uh, the the language that economics uses here is that of prices. And the problem always is that uh, getting the trade off is hard because different people have very different points where they want to trade off. I usually go shopping in the morning. I don't care if the store is, is empty at three o'clock in the evening because I'm, I'm not going to go there anymore. I go shopping at eight o'clock in the morning. So my point of trade off would be a completely different one than somebody who is working in the morning and only can go shopping in the evening. It's a hard question and uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing that Elena was talking about is uh, that was one of the things that I was going to, to ask about one of the uh, other simple questions about um, when you look at when you sell stuff products leftovers at the next day at a discount or whatever, then we're moving away from a news vendor model because then suddenly products uh, have a shelf life of more than one day. And actually, yes, they do have a shelf life of more than one day, even fresh bakery. They can still eat it on the next day. I have eaten bread that was one day ago. So actually you can do that. And uh, the, the very point that we say bakery is, is a news vendor product and that's only one day shelf life, that already gives you something, uh, a point of leverage where we could say we, that in, that induces waste and moving away from that assumption would uh, reduce the waste. But then again, yeah, we have the problem uh, that then suddenly the models become much more complicated. And for bread, it's probably simple because we already, we at least know how old the product is that we have in our shelf because uh, the baker hands you the, the freshest bread or whatever. It gets much more complicated when I talk about yogurt and you have different shelf lives uh, of the different packets of yogurts that are still on the shelf. Do people buy FIFO first in first out so, or a LIFO? Buy they, do they buy LIFO? And the problem is that the retailer doesn't have visibility to the vintages of his product. He doesn't know how much uh, he has like 10 different packages, <coughs> of one flavor of yogurt in the shelf. He knows that assuming his stock is correct, which is another heroic assumption. <laughs> but he doesn't know, are these 10 units here, are they all, will they go bad tomorrow or are they still good for another week? Because he doesn't know how people have been buying stuff. And when you scan the yogurt at the 
at the cash register, it doesn't know about the uh, the remaining shelf life because that is not encoded in the product code. Mm. And funnily enough, or interestingly enough, retailers are slowly moving towards article codes that actually encode the remaining shelf life. And once they do that, we'll have much more visibility and much more opportunities to actually improve matters. But until then, we we actually, that's another thing that we need to estimate, the FIFO, LIFO um, uh, behavior of customers. And that's actually uh, one of those things where we, with our product, struggled mightily with because uh, news vendor is, yeah, it's very important. That's the ultra fresh products, but then there is a huge amount of products that are not ultra fresh, they have a shelf life of more than one day, but they're still fresh. They have a shelf life that's perhaps a couple of days or up to two weeks, and then we still have this uh, wastage problem. And but then I, suddenly I, the FIFA leaf will be here. You're on a riff here, Stefan. But <laughs> I, I, it seems to me that uh, the models are getting way outside wearing your other hat of the software implementation. So, you know, just, yeah, I mean, we, we can do all these increasingly fancy models but if you as you, I'm sure you're right say that actually implementation can't yet manage to deal with uh, any reasonable estimates of stockouts uh, yeah. I, I don't think this is <laughs> I, the, I, I must uh, at least to permit myself a, a minor joke about German bread versus French bread and the uh, day, day versus the week uh, lifespan. But anyway, we'll leave that aside. <laughs> right. I think we need to finish. Thanks everyone for, uh, well, thanks Annalina for the great presentation. Thanks Stefan for your comments and thanks everyone yeah. for joining us. Uh, very stimulating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you Thanks very much. Coming. It was a wonderful afternoon. Have a great day. Bye. Have a good day. Thanks, you bye too. Bye. bye.